your work you would like to mention here. And I would like to first start with, uh, or first invite Laila. How do you talk about what no one wants to talk about? And what are your strategies in doing so? And what obstacles do you encounter? Um, I'll start by saying first that I remember very clearly the first playwriting class um, that I got was an exercise to write um, gossip, to write a dialogue of gossip between two people. And in order to experiment or think about power structures of a conversation. And I realized from that moment that we are mostly taught or uh, when the discussion is about theater performance art is about what is talked about or what will be talked about. But I realized pretty on that what interested me more was this question of how to capture silence or how to capture what is talked about in society, even if not uttered, and how that is possibly done in theater, which is for me merely a collective moment, a moment of sharing, possibly a dialogue between some, however one sees that dialogue. And to think further of what stirred that interest was mainly the question of human loneliness. Later I learned in circles that the more refined word to use would be marginalization. But at the core of it for me is human loneliness, be it produced for an individual or a group of people um, because of a topic that is um, I think that the reason I don't want to kind of say it but I think loneliness for me is produced by a certain condition of power or a relationship of an individual to another or also of an authority to this small individual but also um, by the mere condition of either being not up to a certain norm or deciding to resist consciously as a choice being up to that norm. And for me, I think those were the things that started getting me interested in making theater. Whatever the topics that came with that, that for me were very much embedded in a personal experience and not rather this big question of let's talk about something that no one is talking about. And the urgency for that out of very individual experiences for myself or rather encountering someone who has an experience that somehow needs to be shared or a question that needs to be shared. So the, the topics can vary. They can, they can include, you know, in certain sensitive uh, um, aspects related to gender identity or sexuality or questions of privilege or why some are more equal than others or, uh, you know, political and economic sieges or choice, controversial choices such as sex work or abortion or um, all these also questions related to 
violence, uh, health, mental health, which are said to produce marginalization. As I said, for me, theater is a public or semi-public moment, an opportunity to share. So the strategies for me to do that have to be also, in a way, collective. And that is, for me, the ensuring um, of avoiding that risk that you mentioned in your questions about you know, how to not patronize or... But I think, for me, also, other than that collectivity of that decision, I think the sharing of vulnerability is, for me, a key element when addressing the question here today. Um, I think the starting of personal experience and the thinking of theater as such, even if a question is addressed in a larger way, not merely through a story or an event, avoids some of the dangers of this generalization or also the not forgetting to keep re-questioning privilege and position. I think when I uh, started work, that was my main interest. I think now, over the years, I might be humbled more to think of theater and the choice of topics as really focusing on the tiniest of details, on brief moments, and to merely want to share that and not think of the effect of that as more than the effect of sharing a detail or a moment. So I don't overestimate for me the power of the effect of that in uh, bringing out change. But I think it's really, for me, that detail from human being to human being, or that moment from human being to human <coughs> being. And that is the strategy on how to do it. Obstacles might be, you know, censorship, either proposed by the government, or inner censorship within the audience, or inner censorship within the core of people. But all of these also, I mean, even inner censorships are questions that need to be listened to. And I think it's not only about what to talk about for an audience, but also to focus on that process of amongst the makers of um, to also keep re-questioning. Thank you. So I, I think I understood that your work, the, the core of your work actually is the, the question of our panel, how to um, talk about or uh, how to do theater or our artwork about something that no one wants to talk about. Um, you mentioned obstacles and strategies. Do you have um, an example? of where you, you know, something was almost impossible to do and you could nevertheless do the work or maybe you couldn't, I don't know. Could you maybe share a story? Uh, I think there are different levels. I mean, on a, on a structural level, the, the obstacle or difficulty of making work and deciding not to present it in front of censorship creates certain decisions to the modes of production and how to avoid um, going through censorship in the first place. Which then also, when I talk about the collectivity of making work, it's not only about decision making of what is to be said, but also who is to be involved in that moment is a decision of when I start working with collaborators, um, especially since 2010. I mean, 2010 was the last time I somehow submitted a script to censorship. Uh, 
would be to, okay, so we will make a work, we are starting to make it, money is not sure yet, the censorship question, we will not present it, so it will not be completely legal. So there is a shared responsibility, there is, these are the risks that will not be uncalculated, but there are risks. Are you still interested or is this a work you want to make or not? So this is the first step in putting the team together, uh, first of all. But also then regarding, uh, I mean, regarding especially sensitive social issues or political issues, I mean, there are always multiple ways of, as I said, saying things without spelling them out or uttering them, and not that that undermines expressiveness. Thank you so much. I would like to invite Mandeep now to address the question of how is how do you talk in your work about norms to talk about? Um, so my work, um, I realized very recently is based on on this really nagging feeling that uh, that uh, that I have, which is growing more and more inside me each day, about how dance is possibly the most apolitical of disciplines in the country, uh, in India. Um, and the reason for this is the fact that it is it has been taken over, was taken over by um, this national identity project around the time of independence, which is you know building building India's. Um, um, uh, image of national identity, but especially through dance, um, where dance be became a kind of uh, embodiment of its 4,000 years of history. Um, and you can see that how, how over, over, over the last many decades since the independence, um, this uh, national identity project hasn't left our field of dance, where you're, um, the, the dance that, mo that mostly uh, is supported by the state is a particular kind of dance. It is from the eight classical dance forms and those are forever growing in number. Um, so when I came, fell into dance, I realized that that was one of the, the, the problems I had, that I couldn't identify with this national identity project. Um, and I didn't want to be embodying um, a, a mythological um, stories. Um, at the same time, having trained in London um, for a couple of years, I realized that, uh, that the, the other uh, animal in the room was uh, the fact that contemporary dance language uh, in the world um, is one particular kind of language. It comes from, um, and most of it really comes with, with a big gusto, comes from uh, America and Europe. And um, because we have no alternative to uh, classical dance, that seems to be the only alternative that enters uh, um, our imagination through YouTube, through cultural exchange, through what have you. Um, so my, my, uh, this irritation with the dance field really uh, uh, is where the work began. So I want to talk about one of the works, uh, two of the works that I made in the last couple of years. Uh, one of them is called A Meal and Has Street Anthony. Um, through which I began to look at um, uh, notions of masculinity that, uh, that's, uh, that are located in one's body um, and began to sort of look at uh, this formation of one's gender um, very much like, a, um, like a, a, a training system that dance itself comes with. You know, a set of instructions that are repeated to you over and over again um, that and with gender, it's as early as your birth, where you begin to then embody these instructions and begin uh, and they enter the muscularity of your body and you begin to sort of hold your body uh, up in a particular way. Um, and I realized that as a child, I uh, resisted it quite a bit. You know, there were, there, there were many instructions I resisted. I didn't want to talk the way I was told to talk. I didn't want to stand the way uh, I was told to stand and so on and so forth. Uh, what I wanted to wear, uh, you know, what I wanted to play, I felt like all of it was controlled. Um, and not just parents, but also, you know, um, uh, media had information that was thrown at you. you it, it was coming at you from all, all sides. So this project really was to look at uh, that training system, uh, whether we can actually dismantle that training system, look at what what is being proposed to us, wh where 
Uh, where does masculinity sit in one's muscularity? Where does it sit in the wrist? How does it uh, embody itself in one's knee? Um, and what are those ideas that sit in these different body parts? Um, but also to look at how does um, this idea of gender sit in uh, a very simple act of walking in transfer of weight from one foot to another. Um, what, are, what is that information that's sitting in there? Can we begin to deconstruct that? Um, and also what kinds of, um, uh, what kind of masculinity can play out at the surface of the skin? So the minute you're in contact with another body or in proximity with another body, uh, what are those various codes that play out that, uh, that um, uh, keep those notions of masculinity uh, alive? Um, so that was that. Um, a couple of years later, I created a work called Queen Sites, which came um, as a response to an article that a friend of mine uh, had written about 16 years ago, 17 years ago. Uh, he died in a car crash soon after. He was a gay rights activist. Um, uh, based in New Delhi. Uh, he'd written this article uh, which was titled Why My Bedroom Habits Are Your Business. Um, and he, he argues that actually I'm not okay with my sophisticated friends telling me that they're okay with my sexuality as long as it is behind closed doors. Um, and in the article he argues that actually till the time we have all have equal sexual rights, my sexuality is everyone's business. Um, and he begins to talk about uh, this particular uh, section of the law, section 377, which is a gift to us by the British, um, uh, which continues to be operational in our country, uh, which criminalizes homosexuality. Thank you. <laughs> which criminalizes homosexuality in the country. So reading that article, I realized that, uh, uh, that um, one, I wanted to build a conversation with Nishit uh, 15 years on. I felt like his article uh, uh, still had a, a, a kind of call to put your own personal per personal stories at stake um, for uh, uh, for larger change, um, but also as personally, I wanted to respond to his ideas. Um, um, so we uh, I began to formulate this particular um, piece, which uh, which we perform tomorrow. Um, but it looks at um, mass uh, looks at intimacy being played out by two male bodies. Um, on a, on a bed-like setting where we invite the audience pretty close to the bed uh, over a period of two and a half hours. And the idea is really uh, to bring in this, uh, the gaze of the audience to be part of the performance where the viewing, because you're watching it so closely, where the viewing of the work becomes part of the work itself. Where uh, me watching the work through your gaze and your morality uh, becomes very much a part of uh, 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 me viewing um, something which, um, uh, which which I may find problematic or I may be okay with it. Um, so it's really a question of how does one bring in the gaze to be part of the viewing of the work. Um, I want to finish maybe just by uh, uh, showing a small clip of the work. Sound isn't working, but that's fine. We'll watch it also this week, this weekend. No? Yeah, I think you watch it tomorrow. Too. Yeah. So there were some internal obstacles, like uh, with, from within the structuring of the work, where you felt like 
when I watched it many times over and invited people to watch it, I knew that they were, um, I knew that it couldn't really be a, a linear piece of work because every time somebody came to see it, when it was put together in a, on a timeline, um, people would say, oh, these, it seems like this particular story's ended this way or they're seeming to break up at the end and so on and so forth. And I realized that actually I wanted to stay within the realm of, of um, uh, universal ideas around um, intimacy. Um, so I chopped the piece up again and we made it um, non-linear. Um, also realized that the challenge of the work was also, because we were talking about choice, that choice had to be given back to the audience as well in the way that they'd like to view the work. Um, and so this thing of keeping the audience captive for uh, a length of time and asking them to view something, I wanted to resist that a little bit, but to say, that the agency is handed back to the audience in the way that they'd like to see the view. The doors, the performers open the doors every five minutes, which means that there's an invitation to leave if you'd like. But if you stay back, you make a choice about how you'd like to see the work. Uh, perhaps you want to shift your position, perhaps you want to move in closer, perhaps you want to go a little bit into the shadows, um, uh, perhaps you want to watch it from the window, through the window. <laughs> Um, so that in the structuring of the work, there were many, many such questions. Um, I think the biggest obstacle uh, was, who am I making this work for? Um, because very often when you make uh, uh, dance work, and especially contemporary dance work, it doesn't really have a life in the country. Where there are all of two and a, one and a half festivals, out of which I run one, so I can't program my own work there. Um, so that other half of festival is the only opportunity for the work to be seen. And if you're making work which is clearly thinking through viewership, then how does one challenge also how, where the work gets uh, seen and how it gets seen. So the, the idea was to also take it out of the theatres um, uh, and really take it to various different kinds of contexts. Um, look at taking it to libraries, to schools, to universities, to rooftop terraces, to people's living rooms, um, to law chambers, and every time the, the, uh, the space lent a, a fresh reading to the work, uh, because the, the, the space and the people who inhabit the space um, uh, also brought in their own context uh, to the work. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much. Um, I would now like to talk about how she talks about what no one wants to talk about. Um, hmm. So primarily what I do is write. And I like writing about things that challenge cultural, not just stereotypes, but um, things that are sort of cast in stone. Um, coming from Africa where we pride ourselves so much in tradition and don't always allow ourselves to interrogate what's problematic about tradition. So I'll write about feminist-like ideas, and I say feminist-like because I don't identify as a feminist, but I do interrogate things that, oppre that are oppressive to womanhood. So, Topics about abortion, about sexuality, about identity even, are things that I like to focus on. Um, human emotions even, because I realize that age doesn't necessarily mean that one is emotionally mature. And in my own evolution as a person, I, I tend to wonder how it affects everyone else, so I would then do research about it and then probably write about it. Um, as far as research is concerned, I question origins, especially about language, especially being African, where right now if it were up to me, I'd speak in Sosot, but now I, I've positioned myself to to make you comfortable so that you hear what I have to say. And yet, this is not a luxury that we can all enjoy. Um, someone would have to come here and translate for me and I don't think anyone in the room can. 
So we interrogate things like, okay, so if Sesotho as it is, is an oral language, what are the politics of um, the orthography of it and the influence on it, given that we began writing Sesotho through the influence of Swiss missionaries? And, <laughs> and so what um, limitations did they have? What urgency is there for us? And how can we sort of intervene that and make it more desirable than, even for kids in Lesotho because a lot of them look down upon the language and culturally, one only tends to appreciate where they come from when they interact with people from elsewhere. So how do you bring that awareness to people who don't have the exposure or people who are so limited by, the, by their immediate environment that they have nothing else as a reference. So we are looking into basically going into schools and promoting critical literacy. So going beyond just reading words, but knowing what words really mean and how words can be manipulated to, to drive certain ideas and certain indoctrinations because our environment is very conservative on paper but people are people and we do things in our private spaces. So how do you bring that into the classroom in a manner that makes learning fun for children, really? You know, because now they have a personal reference point to whatever you're trying to transmit to them. And in a way, it's sort of attempting to decolonize education in general, but literacy especially because it is critical, especially in this age where the world is shrinking and we are bound to interact with one another and things are sometimes said that fly over people's heads and you don't realize that you are either being marginalized or stereotyped or whatever. So it's important for us to know where we stand in, in the global um, sphere so that we can actually speak for ourselves. The whole motive behind the work that we do is to promote controlling the narrative instead of having other people speak on our behalf or other people define who we are for us. Yeah, I think that's it. So I think this last, um, um, the last thing you mentioned is probably also an obstacle mm. to the work that people tend to say what is good and what not. Mm. Or what are the strategies? Um, so in my writing, I try not, obviously, you can always tell what influences a person as objective as they try to be, but I try to keep it open-ended in that people are open, uh, are welcome to have their own interpretation, they are uh, welcome to have opposing views, and it's room for conversation. So, um, through the literature festival that we host, we usually have panel discussions where the audience is welcome to engage with our, with our panelists. And that way we're sort of cutting that barrier of you're so high and important and you're over there and you're inaccessible. Mm -hmm. But bringing people closer and I think that, that opens room for learning. Um, documentation is also quite important because in Lesotho, Archives, the archives that exist are from a long time ago. So then I ask myself, who's documenting the culture that's happening in the moment, you know? And how is it being documented and stored and made accessible to everyone else? So this comes across in the kind of image, the images that I try to create, um, the kind of writing that I try to do, and artistic engagement, because more than anything, I like to connect with other practitioners to hear what they're thinking and what informs their thinking more than just imposing my own views. I hope that answers your question. Yes, yeah. very much. Just one more, one more question, maybe it's a big one. Mm -hmm. um, what are issues that remain unaddressed or that you feel like remain nevertheless yeah. unaddressed? I mean, the 
elephant in the room is still that I'll speak in terms of language. Being fluent in English is a currency, you know, and it sometimes creates a barrier where, for example, we want to, our work is directed at people in the rural areas. And for them, when you open your mouth and you speak like this, it, it's a barrier because they feel like you're not one of us or whatever. And there's a racial dynamic to it too, that if I try to do a certain type of work, I'll get more resistance than if my white partner does it. And yeah, things like that. And also, how do we address the impact of the work of missionaries without offending a, a population of 90% Christians? You know what I mean? So how to say things without actually being explicit about them, but addressing them. Okay, thank you so much. Now I would like to um, come to the work of Nomadik. I think I'll ask Yvonne to answer the question of how do you address things no one wants to talk about. Um, thank you, Fabi, for your explanation. I will make some connection also with that. Um, for us, we came from a Swiss perspective, but what interests us is not only to look to the other, but to think about the entanglements with the other, what and what is the other, so there is no other, so we are thinking uh, what needs uh, um, to talk is, um, you know, what to talk about is uh, we as privileged persons who are teaching in the university in Switzerland, um, and we had that situation that uh, the Institute of our, uh, for Contemporary Art in Zurich asked us to take part in a project who invites eight cities to think about art in public spheres and their uh, political and aesthetical uh, power uh, in, uh, from different countries, from South Africa, Johannesburg, from Mexico, St. Petersburg, etc. And we were asked as a position in Switzerland, especially in Zurich. And the deal was, and I like it, uh, that we don't work over another city, or we travel to uh, Mumbai and over May to work there, so everyone has to work over his own city, over his own country to look at. And we are thinking as Swiss people, but not really Swiss, because we are Austrian, we are some, uh, teaching there, uh, or a German teaching there, uh, what is it to, to work over Switzerland and don't work over the normal uh, stereotypes, what we heard of Switzerland, and decide to work over this uh, big field of economic and uh, financial structures uh, in the trading of raw materials. And when you look at for, for this, you see that Switzerland is has a lot of impact in that in that uh, um, in the economic field, but they are, they are uh, trading not raw raw materials itself. It comes not in Switzerland as import and export. The only one who comes in is gold and chocolate. And so we decide to work with chocolate. Uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I like I like chocolate. <laughs> Or, or, or a 
aware in the topic of, of Switzerland. And also with the fact that this goal is not innocent. So it's a conflict matter. It's still a conflict matter. And so this connection to the globality of globalism from the Switzerland of the goal is huge. And that's what forced us uh, to, to think about how to uh, work with, but we are not politicians, but she's a political theory, therefore we invited her. <laughs> but we as artists, uh, also uh, anthropologists and musicians or something else, uh, we are worked on a very experimental way to deal with the fact that how to deal with in, in, and to deal with desires, emotion, effects and effects in, in the connection of gold. And I will show a small um, clip of that. What is, it's a part of different clips and, and, and sculptures and uh, um, lectures. Uh, what we produce, it's only a small part here uh, for the, the gains on, on gold. So it's the ecology is important. to the internet. Uh, so then we continue and we will show the other one. No, not, 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 not now, later. <laughs> I will go give over to okay. you. Um, yeah, I mean, during the research, um, we kind of started to use the, the term um, post-colonial amnesia in order to address that about what, what no one wants to talk about. Um, in an attempt to find a way to, to, talk, to talk about it, a way to find the words, to find the language, to find um, also an aesthetic language, um, to think about it, what, what does it mean in a way that uh, all that uh, um, in relation to gold? So, um, what does it mean that gold is a, a commodity that comes into Switzerland that has been that relies actually on financial economic infrastructures that have been built up since colonialism in a country which itself sees uh, in the self understanding is that Switzerland has never been a colonial power because Switzerland didn't have proper colonies. Um, and much more resistance attached to kind of 19th century um, image of humanitarianism, humanitarianism <laughs> with people like Henri Dinon, um, the so-called founder of the Red Cross. And um, so yeah, the question really is how to, how to address something like gold, which has its own materiality, its, its history in, in, a, in, a, in a context. Um, where it seems that, that, that we lack um, an understanding, a, a cultural understanding, a, a material understanding of, of, um, of the relations that, that go, they come together with gold. And um, yeah, maybe, I don't know if you want to show the video <laughs> in order to... Um, It doesn't matter if it's fresh, it doesn't matter. It's gone it's blue. blue. <laughs> it's gold, but it's, it's, gold, it's not blue. blue. It's not really blue. No. You need yeah. the cable and it's blue. Perhaps. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I mean one, one important. Oh. Okay. It's the first one. So. 
is always political. But just to repose this question and why, would you like Lila to attempt to first answer? I hope I don't misquote Naomi Wallace, but I think one sentence that was very inspiring for me, which was um, her saying that the choice not to be political is a political choice. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that sums up also this question of how art is viewed but also defined. Because also there is discrepancy there sometimes between how an artist describes his or her work and also how it's viewed. And then the choice to say it is not political um, as a political act, actually. Um, in terms of, I think I, I struggle very much with the definition of social change. So it feels very difficult for me to um, answer that question. Some of these terms, when they've been used and overused, I think have a tendency to either lose meaning or mean one thing for someone and something else for someone else. Um, I think for me, the only thing I can say about the role of art, um, critical art, even, for achieving social change is um, that I think each, that is really a definition for each person to make, whether they are perceiving the art or making it. Okay, thank you. Would you like to uh, comment? I do have similar difficulties with the idea of social change and, and carrying the burden of social change uh, with one's work, but <coughs> I think uh, social change is also, in a way, um, present within the, the forms that we practice. Um, or um, in the same way, uh, um, when you're looking at um, a form that is centered around the body, um, then what does it mean to perform? Um, and what are these, um, wh what is the, the politics that's sitting already in this exchange where someone has something to perform and is inviting somebody else to look at it? Um, I mean, what, in, in the sense that where, very often with performance, you're also placing the performer slightly higher up. Um, so for me, questioning the, uh, the various codes of a performance is really the beginning. Um, one can begin to um, look at the world and respond to all the things that you find uncomfortable or don't agree with. Uh, but from within the discipline that you uh, practice, there are many things that you disagree with already. Um, uh, so those are the kinds of questions that are, I'm also interested in placing on the table that, um, that, um, that there's, there's a call for change from within these disciplines already. Um, from within the practice of arts and making of, of, of arts, um, how does one represent um, through performance and how does one begin to question, dismantle, challenge institutions of power that control the body? Um, how does one begin to find new ways of articulating uh, resistance um, through the body perhaps and perhaps challenging the, the hegemony of the written word? Um, what are the ways in which the body can argue for itself um, without words is something that I'm interested in. Um, and also coming back to this question of how the body in performance or performance itself is inherently political. Mm -hmm. You're placing something in front of anybody else. You're already the politics of representation are at play. Who am I representing? What am I representing myself as? Um, where is the work uh, being funded? <coughs> Who wants to support this kind of work? Um, what kind of market am I playing into? What kind of market am I making work for? Uh, so those motivations make it uh, a highly political act already. So if I understand you correctly, you're saying that the, the act of performing 
performance of, for me already is highly political and is social change. <coughs> In itself or? Or has the same urgency, has the same urgency for, uh, as a call for social change as, uh, as you picking up anything that's outside of your discipline? Would uh, Dineo, Nina, or Yvonne like to um, chip in <laughs> on this question? What is critical art? Um, <laughs> because, as Mandeep just said, like just putting yourself in front of an audience is already a political statement, and there's already some critical engagement happening. Either the audience is judging you, you're judging yourself. Did I say the right thing? Did I miss something? Did I forget something? Am I being articulate enough? Um, my whole thing is, if somebody's thinking is impacted in any way, either they disagree strongly and they can express that, or they agree strongly and they can express that, that for me is social change. Um, I feel like it has to happen on a micro level before we can start thinking about the macro um, impact of, of the kind of work that we do. And in terms of representation, just being yourself, again, is a political statement and it gives other people sort of permission to also do the same or they want to know how you do it so that they can. And that's critical, again, in this time where Propaganda still exists in, in that um, you look at, for example, the UNESCO website, donate now, here's how, um, help kids in Africa, all that, all that. Yes, there are kids who need help in Africa, absolutely. But there's so much that is not said that still needs to be addressed and I feel art has the best access to do so. try to do with the, the project, the psychotropic goal, um, is to find ways how that these materials have, these, these aesthetics, in a way, I use another word, speak for themselves. Um, obviously they don't, they don't speak, but in a way they, they present without representing. And I think that's something um, you can actually look for within our basic practices. It doesn't mean that or is always that, or, um, but yeah, maybe that's the point where to look at what, what, what is actually possible um, with, uh, within art, which is always difficult because it's a very generalizing <laughs> term, but I think that's good use it, so, yeah. Okay, thank you. Would you like to maybe expand a bit more also on the ask or in how far it is decolonizing this Critical artistic practice. You, you mentioned it also in your work. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> to be a bit, you know, to go on even deeper. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I have a problem with the word decolonizing because first we have to admit that coloniality, whatever you want to call it, is still is still very much in effect through neoliberalism, through power um, dynamics and even economic differences. The fact that I cannot fully do the kind of work that I do without getting external funding and the fact that external funding is most likely to come from here. Um, and that has terms and conditions that it comes with. So when we speak about decolonizing, I, I think really what we're trying to do in my context is shed light on the fact that coloniality is some, it's nuanced and it's still very present and it should be a collective effort to like confront it and interrogate it and create alternatives to it. But it as, a, as, a, as an ideology or as a theory, I don't think it exists. Yeah. Okay. I, I 
highlight the term delinking more as recognizing. Mm. And if you are uh, in the position of the, the education, then you have a lot of possibilities to delink. Mm. But being political, not only to say it's good if you make a cut, but to explain where the things are entangled together. And that's a composition where you also take reference to yourself. So what of what of role you are speaking in teaching and criticize it in that at that moment also. And that is a kind of epistemic obedience. I think that's a good but I I it's obedience. <laughs> I I try to But I mean, you're invited also to comment on your perspective. But I'll still pose the next question because you're talking about the self positioning. Um, and from my own experience, critical work would always ask for a constant effort of critical self reflection, also within um, the work you're doing, within the context to where you're situating the work. And now I was wondering how do you go about this challenge to, on one hand, constantly question? you know, yourself and your work, and on the other to deal with the pressure to make artistic productions, because this is your <laughs> work you're doing, and to be able to make a living, to earn enough money, to find the funds you need, and you know, this really seems to be uh, a challenge, uh, a conflicting challenge, and yes, how, how, how do you deal with it? Would you, would you like to respond first? No, I can wait for someone. Okay, so whoever wants to. <laughs> okay, okay. I mean, this question relates also to the position on the historic institutions, um, in a way. Um, and I think if you're in a position, also like me, you have more or less funding than a research project, so you, you don't rely, so for at least for the kind of basic um, <laughs> income, you don't uh, rely so much on funding, so maybe it's easier actually to take also critical um, position towards funding institutions. So in a way, um, and, and that makes it, yeah, it, it depends how you, it, it influences how you position, you can position yourself, how you can um, take, for example, a lot of people in the morning they talk about independent from, from what? Obviously independent from kind of power relations, maybe independent institutions, independent, independent of money flows. Um, so, but what does that really mean? Um, who ha has the possibility to say, yeah, I'm independent? Um, which aspects, um, yeah, with which factors come in here? And um, of course, I, for, for for me, I think it's very important to reflect on, on the position, on the possibilities, on the, on, on, on the privilege in a way you have um, to, to think about, also to think about the own position, to articulate all the factors that influence um, uh, the way to, to, to you address an issue. And um, yeah, for example, I mean, also all aspects for, for me are uh, relevant there is the relation between paid and unpaid labor. If we talk about um, how you sustain yourself as a cultural worker, as an artist, as a researcher, it also means that you do paid and unpaid labor. It's a division that is very questionable, but in generally in the in the in the way cultural work is, is funded and how you do it, we don't have often you don't have the possibility to make negotiate that as well. So that's for me very important. Um, a lot of uh, cultural work is a very kind of effective work as well. It's, it's a, um, we, we, we want to do that, we really want to do that, we also do it unpaid, but what does it mean to, to be able to do it unpaid, or to do certain things unpaid? Um, yeah, I think that's yeah, important questions that come up. Yeah. I can't help thinking that uh, that's it, in one in the way that one positions oneself in the self positioning that there are these blind spots that we don't see or we don't want to see. And I think uh, for me, it's, um, one of the blind spots is um, uh, uh, one of 
privilege and class. And in India, I think that's a, a pretty, I mean, it's a reality where I come from a certain privilege and I can actually, you know, uh, I can write a page of proposal and I can write it in English and I can send it to Prohibitia Delhi, you know, and, and it comes with a certain kind of um, 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 class privilege. And I don't know what to do about this awareness when it does come away from being a blind spot and becomes something that you're aware of. But I know that it's somewhere sitting sits in my head that there are all those other people who don't have the same privilege and can't, don't have the resources to make the kind of work they want to make. Um, yeah, and I'm just throwing that here as something that is unresolved in, in one's head. I don't, the question is tough because I think, um, like right post 2011, um, I produced a series of work called No Time for Art, uh, which is, was main, mainly um, work around police and military violence 
at a time when also very much the revolution in Tahrir Square and that vibe was celebrated. Uh, and there was hardly any talk because mainly what started as media taboo being uh, talked about, about military violence when the military council took over. And um, part of that work, for example, was documentary performance, which was uh, what you in other cultures could call verbatim theater or uh, very simple minimalistic work on stage. But part was also interactive where leaflets were something that had happened on the street uh, and a political act by a visual artist where she gave people papers that were written, I demand uh, the trial of the um, killer of, and then the name of each person and how they had died and their age and information about them was distributed on the street. And that became part of this series of work where that would happen in a theater space in attempt to have a collective shared moment of first of all raising the question of that no one was actually punished or trialed or addressed, but also uh, bringing forward the identities of each of those people who died somehow collectively in a shared space. And this work, for example, was sometimes called activistic, sometimes it was called propaganda, uh, revolution propaganda. Sometimes it was called uh, just merely performance as part of um, contemporary art. Uh, it was called different things. And I think this question, I personally don't really believe in the term activistic art, but I think it's also very much, when we talk about art, it is at the end of the day, an experience and we cannot define an experience for someone else. I think each person who experiences it, whether on the side of the maker or the person experiences it in the audience or in that shared space, has a different view on it. I think you need also an awareness of art and what can art do. So, for me, it's a, my family came from Syria, so I'm part of white, but my family came from Syria. And it's, it's a really a, a nice and, 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 and at the moment, uh, a, a country with twice, uh, five or six years before to, to save the, the, the rainforest and, and then so many rainforests. But now with the, with, with the development also of the, of the globalization, of the function of gold, and with the, the try to control the digging of gold, of the small gold in, in Brazil, a lot of small gold diggers came to Suriname and they now destroy with the mercury itself and some of the, the Amazonian uh, rainforest. So I'm working on gold, but here I have, what, we have, what I'm doing, they have no impact on that, what happens there. And I'm talking to my family and this is a kind of privilege for people there. They have no way to act with that situation. It's, it's totally uh, um, um, overwhelming, it's not controllable, it happens, but I'm an artist and I have no chance to have the impact on that. So I'm working on that. Um, so actually, for me, Queen Size was 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 a, a piece of art uh, activism through the arts. For me, it was quite clear that the framing of the work, in the way that the work was framed, titled, and how it responds very directly to Section Three Seven Seven, was a, a very very uh, political um, uh, statement. Um, also, in the same way where I felt that in 2015, where there was a right-wing uh, fervor sort of uh, gripping the country, it was very important for me to also assert my identity as a, 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 a gay dance maker. And I felt like that it was more important than ever. And I may never assert my identity again, but I thought that that was a moment for me to do that. 
Um, I may not uh, hang on to that identity for too long, but uh, in a way, the way that one, one frames the work has very much to do with, with uh, the kind of um, um, political um, uh, thrust that the work has. Having said that, one in the making of the work and after, uh, one had to keep going back to what the discipline is really about. What what does what do the arts do that that nothing else can? Um, um, what what is the logic of the arts? How do uh, the arts make something available to see? Uh, perhaps to defamiliarize something. Perhaps some uh, to make certain something surreal. Um, to bring in a fresh gaze to something that you know already. Uh, one had to keep returning to what that logic of the arts is. Um, operating in a space where, as far as stereotypes go, um, we have political leaders that are very self-serving and problematic in many ways. So there's an urgency to create and whatever we create inevitably becomes political. Um, but then the question rises, how, does, how do we expect the audience to engage with art? Because one has to have a certain awareness or <coughs> literacy, <laughs> visual literacy or whatever form of art to be able to interpret the art. Um, and that goes back to how are people educated, again, making it political. Either way, it's, it's inevitable, but I don't know if I want to be associated with that. Um, another stereotype is that as long as one is artistic, they are political. Therefore, you are kind of expected to be controversial, to be radical, to be whatever. But there's some very conservative art artists out there that serve very different, I guess, ideas than what we have. Um, one might promote the notion of Christianity is the best way to save your life. We don't all agree with that. So it's political, but not. Yeah. Um, yeah, maybe one way of seeing art as activist, I think, is linking it to political and social practices. Um, and in this kind of interconnection, in this kind of ecology, if you want to call it like that, um, I think their art can be activist. But it's, it's not as a, um, in a way for a political framework to say art has to have an impact in that way or in that manner. But if you see artistic practice as an ecological practice that is linked to political social conditions, to the way we and talk to each other the way we're sitting here, the way we want to engage and uh, address an issue, and so on. Um, I think art, in a way, is or can be activist, but often, I mean, it involves a lot of difficult questions, like who is speaking for whom, who is addressing whom with, with this, or, uh, yeah, so, um, I think it can be, <laughs> it can be helpful, but it also can be very problematic. ask art to be activists in that sense. And on the topic of who are you addressing, like, in Lesotho, the kind of people that we want to address, the policy makers, the powers that be, they don't attend things that we host, but when they're busy campaigning, they will say, we're going to put this much money into the arts, we want the youth to thrive and whatnot, but they're never there. So we take it upon ourselves to, to do things without, we, in spite of them. You know, where we're not going to wait for that to happen, we'll find ways to mobilize resources. There's also that very strong feeling that we are resources, so it's not always a matter of money, if it means that much to you, but really what you're trying to say and the message that you're trying to um, get across. Thank you so much. I think we need to take um, at least one, two, three more questions. Or I think we'll take them and then all the four of them and then reply within the time we still have. Yes, uh, my name is Lazar. I feel like from Madagascar. So when I'm listening to you, I feel like um, it is not easy, it is complicated. For so my, my question is. Uh, what keeps you doing that? What, you know, I mean, about food, uh, funding from food is and whatever. What keeps it alive? 
can speak for myself, <laughs> just one thing. I think I haven't found anything else that I'm more able <laughs> to do in a very blunt way because I think it's been a long process of thinking and rethinking whether that makes sense and the role of it and why and how and all of these questions that can become kind of almost uh, stifling or paralyzing almost at points and it's only if you have a very strong sense of urgency in that moment of what you want to create from within or uh, something that you really, this idea of that there is something that you really need to do and now and other than that it can easily become paralyzing or stifling if the compass of that which loses its way sometimes happens. Uh, my name is Roman and I'm, I'm working with SDC in Tunis and Cairo. Um, one of the things I, I find myself struggling with is to avoid becoming part of the constraints um, about what you can talk about. Because by providing the funding, we are becoming part of the problem as well. But um, there is another issue I would like to hear you about is what kind of compromises are you ready or obliged to do to reach out? In other words, you, you spoke about the relatively privileged class that is producing art, but uh, one of the ways uh, regimes or authoritarian societies have to, to maintain these discourse constraints is to make it possible to express uh, alternative views or uh, the things nobody wants to talk about in a circle and an audience that is in itself the very class that is preventing changes to take place. In other words, if you produce uh, works, you will have an audience of diplomats of the, of, of the capital and of the um, second or third daughters of the ruling class, the ones who are not doing business, so I, I'm, I do it a bit strongly. And if you want to reach out in the countryside, if you want to reach out in, with people, you might have to do other types of compromise in the language you're using for, for performances, and also the art. The, the art. You, you are also touching on artistic independence and, and, and license because you have to find the right, the right language. How do you balance these different levels of compromises that you have to, to get into to, to reach out? Okay, I think, can somebody just answer this question and then we take the two more and then we have to stop. Um, so there are things that you, when you make work, you think, okay, this is something that I don't want to compromise on. So you give yourself these things of, you know, I don't want to perform it in Delhi, Bombay, and Bangalore, and that's the end of the work. So with Queen Size, that was quite clear. I didn't want to finish there. And yet, um, because the performance ecology isn't that uh, highly developed, um, I knew that it was going to be a challenge. How does one get on the road and begin to perform outside of these cities? Uh, we've now done about 23, 24 cities in the country, uh, mostly by, uh, by getting onto trains and just deciding we're going to go to the city. Also because we identified that they were friends or artists or not necessarily people we knew, but people who introduced us to them who were willing to hold the piece uh, uh, up in the city that they were inviting us to. So for us, it was also uh, uh, an amazing way to get to know a whole lot of people who uh, would stand for a work like this. Uh, so the compromise you make then is that you are um, reliant on their circles and the people that they, they, they feel safe uh, inviting to the show. Um, so you have gotten out of the cities that that you uh, that you, uh, that you don't want to be in only, and yet you're still possibly in the same circles, um, but in another city. So yeah, that's the challenge. There were 
for two more questions. No? One more? <laughs> this is the last one. I'm sorry. Hi, it's uh, Dilan uh, from Pakistan. Uh, how to talk about what no one wants to talk about? Like, you know, having said that, you know, I would start saying something about uh, the artist, basically. You know, as per my knowledge and understanding, if an artist wants to produce something, he wants recognition. He wants that, you know, everyone wants, everyone should see that and, and, and you know, appreciates that. I've not come across anybody who's like, you know, I'm making paintings, but I've done them in store, no one should be seeing them. So it's, it's obvious that, you know, everyone who produces, they want this recognition. But the important question here is that, you know, if you're producing that, you already should be, it, it, it should be in your head that, you know, who is the audience actually? Who, to whom you want to convey this message to? You know, I had a teacher actually who was himself a poet and we were like, you know, in an in a English class and he was, we were doing the explanation of some poetry work and he said something that I still remember. He said that the actual meaning of this poetry, only that poet knows, knows you know, because, because in his lifetime he's gone through different experiences that have influenced this final like five words or ten words or whatever word. We cannot know the whole picture. We only can interpret as per our understanding what it is about, you know. So this is also like something important that we should know. And, and, and you know, when we have to answer to this question that uh, how to talk about what no one to talk about, the first point that comes to my mind is that you have to put yourself in the shoes of your audience or the viewer or to whom you want to convey this message to so that you know that what would be the, you, you know, repercussions of this, this thing, you know. And secondly is, of course, in, in, in our stress development terms, we use this term, do no harm, you know. That you should not create something that creates a problem for somebody else. For example, if you're making a video for maybe gay rights activists, you know, so you have to hide the identity of the person. You know, you cannot make a video saying that this guy travels from A speed to B speed every day in the morning. So, of course, then he will be exposed. So you have to be in, in, in that element, you know. And third point, which would be the final point, actually, would be that any change comes slowly and gradually in any society, you know. So it has to be, the message has to be gradual and consistent. That's the only way how it's going to happen. I always use this, uh, you know, example that, you know, one, as an example, like, for example, if, if a literacy rate of a particular area is like 5%, and you're talking about that it should be 100%. So it's not like, you know, it should be an ideal situation like this, but it's not possible in a short time. So from five, you have to target 6%, 7%, and then move forward. So you cannot expect that the whole thing changes suddenly. Thank you. Somebody wants to reply to these comments. There are more comments, actually, than uh, questions. I just can say one thing that I think when we speak of uh, of something that no one wants to talk about, I think I can speak for myself at least. What's interesting is how to do that in a way that continues a conversation. So if I'm talking about self-censorship of audience or sensitivity of topics in our societies or political issues which are, uh, you know, not everyone agrees on or whatever controversies. I think the question is, we are creating art for other people to engage with it, not for personal pleasure merely. And I think the question is how to do so in a way where not all the audience walks out after five minutes, but how to make sure that whether it's not by uttering it in the same way or whether it's by medium or whether it's by the mere fact of process, thought process or questioning that happens uh, with the content that it continues to be a conversation uh, for as long as it lasts and hopefully after. Um, very, very short. Okay, uh, for me it's language. Um, one always has to go through a process of educating self and this happens through a process of unlearning and challenging your own biases. So if, before you answer the question of how to talk about what no one wants to 
talk about, would you be comfortable hearing what nobody wants to talk about? And how do you say it in a manner that can be well received? It won't always be that way, but at least afford you some audience. Um, so it, it comes from empathy and a lot of self-reflection, I think, and vulnerability to some extent, because you can only put yourself in the next person's shoes if, if you're vulnerable. I just wanted to respond also to the first question that you'd asked about what keeps you going. Uh, um, for me, I think it, it's quite important when I'm making work that I, I mean, it's strange to say it, but I need to feel, I need to feel some kind of fear in the gut, um, where I feel like if I make this, <laughs> I'm putting something at stake. Um, and very often with the works that I have made, I've always felt this fear that what is my father going to say about this? Or what is my mother going to say? Um, what's going to happen to, am I making pornography? You know, this sort of beginning to question yourself. Um, and I feel like that's what keeps me going. And I'm happy to wait for years before I can feel that again. And I'm happy to let go of the fear of making stuff only because I need to be making. That's what I do. Um, but sometimes I'm happy to wait to see, do I even have anything to say? Um, and coming to your question, what I like uh, about, what, what I find fulfilling about making then is also this thing that if I feel this fear, there are many people who feel the same thing, that this vulnerability is what what is driving a whole lot of us um, to do things, to say things, then can we, instead of me making a work where it is about my vulnerabilities, can, can, can we begin to address um, vulnerabilities that we all share, is, is a kind of place that I'd like to uh, make from. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you for your patience. Thank you so much for this very interesting <coughs> conversation. I think it's um, a great, um, not uh, a continuation of the conference, and I'm looking forward to address more of these questions of who is addressed, you know, what is art uh, exactly, what artists funded, and who is supposed to be addressed.